Have you ever been on a road trip? I have been on many. I'm a, I'm a road trip fan. Oh, you're a road uh, tripper. <laughs> no, Kyle, you and I went on a road trip recently where we oh. drove an ungodly amount of hours in a short span of time. <laughs> that is true. And we spoke nothing to each other the entire way there. Well, we uh, it's true. And we spoke nothing to each other on the entire way back because we listened to show tunes the whole way. It was honestly... It was great. The best experience I've ever had. But have you had any non butter no parsnips <laughs> road trips? <laughs> yeah, I mean, nothing, nothing like crazy. My family and I drive up to Maine every summer. I've been down to D.C. a couple of times. What are the uh, pit stops like on the way to Maine? Well, I would say as you get further north up the coast, it does get more like outdoorsy. You know, oh. like you walk out of a pit stop in Connecticut and it's like, ah, I, God, I hate my life. And then you walk out <laughs> to a pit stop in Maine and you're like, oh, the great outdoors. <laughs> Watch out, Connecticut. <laughs> Emily's coming for you. <laughs> Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. Every week on Butter No Parsnips, your hosts Emily Moyers and Kyle Imperator take you on an adventure through the weird, wacky, wonderful, and sometimes even wicked world of one wayside word. Strange characters, delightful bits, and general joyousness abound. Join them as they test each other's etymological expertise. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. Whoa! <laughs> Look how smooth and non-awkward that was. It was I'm beautiful. Emily Moyers. <laughs> and I'm Kyle Imperator. Kyle, do you have any other questions or prompts or words, perhaps, today? Uh, no words today. I figured oh, we that's just... That's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> I figured we'd just, uh, like our road trip, sit in silence yeah. um, and listen to show tunes. <laughs> <laughs> no, Emily, I have a word for you today, and I'm so excited about it. Are you ready for what it is? I'm ready for what it is. Tell me what okay. it is. <laughs> Your word today is caravanserai. <gasps> C-A-R-A-V-A-N-S-E-R-A-I. Caravanserai. Kyle, you want to yes. know what's crazy? For the second time now, uh, yes. I sort of know what this word means oh. because of critical role. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, hey, kids, when your parents tell you to stop playing Dungeons and Dragons because you're not going to learn anything. You'll learn so many words. <laughs> this is proof positive that they are wrong. <laughs> you can stop listening to your parents. That's the moral of our podcast. <laughs> I don't clearly know what the word. I have a vague idea, so I'm gonna, okay. you know, I'm gonna do the typical tiptoeing around first. Love it. The language of origin, I gotta figure, is like some sort of Arabic language I, in that realm. It's in that realm. You're in that in close. that part of the world. If by that part of the world, you mean the Eastern Hemisphere, you are correct. Oh, what, what is the language of origin? The language of origin is Persian. Persian. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And it is a noun. It is a noun. Yes, correct. Okay. That's a relief. I mean, I think it does relate to, uh, you don't have to tell me if I'm right or wrong yet, but mm -hmm. I think it does relate to caravans. I don't know that for sure. Can I have a hint? The hint that I have for you today is hospitality oh i think that makes sense because i think the context that i've heard it in this dungeons and dragons game mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that it was like a sort of a tavern made of tent <laughs> like, yeah, are you saying you know? it's a tavern that's tents <laughs> or is it just made of a tent material <laughs> <laughs> well i think it's it's like i think he was saying like the walls are just like canvas sheets it's not really like a building I'm going to tell you, when you take your guess, I want you to take one step back from your specificity. Okay. So I think a caravanserai is when a caravan that has been moving, like, sets up, can't, like, is stationary and stable. Oh, somehow that wound you up further from where oh, you no. needed to be. <laughs> <laughs> What does the word mean, Kyle? Emily, I'm going to say that you got it with what you said previously. Is it a tavern made of tent? Yeah. Is it like an inn? 
It's like an inn. Yeah, it's yeah. That's exactly what it is. It's not made of tent. Is what I was trying to get at. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but a caravanserai is a type of roadside inn, usually with a central courtyard for caravans to rest. That provides oh. co- accommodation for travelers along trade routes. Wow, but it is is like buildings. Yes, it's it's they they are physical permanent locations. Except gotcha. for, you know, time immemorial. <laughs> you know, the yeah, impermanency yeah. of time. <laughs> for sure. You know, I mean, we're not yeah. talking about like Old West caravans. We're talking like Campbell caravans. Oh, we're yeah. talking about Old East caravans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell me more. So, Emily, caravanserai ultimately comes from the Persian word karvanserai, which means caravansary. And it's sort of a compound word, like oh. breakfast or handshake, right? Sure. Uh, you seem to have alluded it, to it previously, but Emily, do you know what a caravan is? It's like a like a wagon train. It's like a bunch of, of travelers traveling together for safety in numbers. That is literally exactly it, yes. Yeah. It has come to mean by extension because of like the way it looks when a caravan is traveling we now call a train of similar vehicles a caravan regardless of whether or not they're traveling in this context but originally it was just a group of travelers journeying together for safety was a caravan yeah that comes from the persian karvan which is ultimately from a proto-indo-european word meaning army does caravan specifically refer to like vehicles or could like a group of walking travelers be considered a caravan a group of walking travelers could be considered a caravan more often than not though they were traveling by vehicle but the vehicle would have been camel or horse sure i mean camels famously good at that famously good at that they're only famously good at Three things. One, (laughs) carrying items. Two, storing water. And what was the third one, Emily? Uh, Well, a real answer, walking on sand because of the shapes of their hooves. (laughs) Fake answer, juggling. (laughs) Juggling. Yeah, you got it. (laughs) So, Emily, the... I, like I said, uh, not too long ago, caravanserai is sort of a compound word. Do you know what a sarai is? That part I do not know. So a sarai is a palace or an inn or a dwelling of some sort. Those are three different types of establishments. <laughs> yes, the word has multiple meanings. Yeah, but like vastly different. (laughs) Yes, vastly different. Absolutely. Well, it's because it comes from the Persian word sarai, which means palace or inn, which comes from other words that were less specific. It it eventually came from a Proto-Iranian word meaning to protect and a Proto-Indo-European word that was like to pass through or something like that or to Mm. overcome. So uh, both caravan and sarai can now be used synonymously with caravan sarai. They they both have one of their meanings is an inn where travelers stay. Oh, interesting. I've never heard caravan used in that way. Me either. But I, I think it's mistakenly used that way. Right. And it's just <laughs> been so often that it's been used that way that it's just taken on a life of its own, you know? That's fair. I mean, yeah. Americans will do anything to say fewer syllables. So exactly. A word like caravanserai is bound to get chopped. <laughs> yeah. And it's undoubted that the, the Persian word that caravanserai came from is a compound word, but the English word is most likely a direct translation of the Persian, not putting the English caravan and sarai together. <laughs> So picture it, Emily, (gasps) Asia slash North Africa, somewhere between like 500 BCE and 1500 BC. All right. (laughs) What a what a well-defined setting, both in place (laughs) and time. (laughs) Are you picturing it? All of the sounds and smells of this very moment? Of all of those moments that (laughs) you just put us in? Sure. Asia, Uh, North Africa, anywhere between (laughs) China and Morocco. And Morocco, from anywhere between literally. what time spans? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Emily, so you're a tradesman, right? And you're trying to find people to sell your wares to. What are you selling, man? Oh, I feel I'm selling turmeric. Ganja. <laughs> 
<laughs> I sure turmeric. Why not? That's what you're trading. <laughs> no, you know what I'm trading, Kyle? I'm trading parsnips. We I messed this up parsnips. once before. I'm not going to oh, mess yeah. it up again. <laughs> we can't mess it up anymore. <laughs> the answer is parsnips. <laughs> <laughs> so historically, Emily, depending on the time and location, one who was trading at this point in time could be trading anything from textiles to tea and perfumes to paper and gunpowder or even some wealthier commodities like wine and gold, right? Oh, boy, I should have said gold. You I'm going to go broke gold, selling parsnips. You're starting Jeez. parsnips. I don't know how long those are going to last. <laughs> That's like I'm playing Trail to Oregon and I said... Why be a banker when I could be a farmer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Emily, what route might you take on your trade? Oh, I think the only route that I know is the uh-huh. s- silk one. <laughs> is the silk one? <laughs> or is that Silk Boulevard, I believe? <laughs> um, Marvin Gardens. <laughs> Marvin Gardens. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, Emily. So the largest and most well-known of these routes, the Silk Road, yeah. it's named for the silk trade that it fostered. And it was actually a network of roads that spanned all the way from Imperial China in the east west to the Mediterranean Sea on both sides. It kind of split at the end and went north to Europe and south to Africa. So although... You're traveling in a caravan, Emily, trading Mm -hmm. your parsnips. The cities that you pass along the Silk Road aren't conveniently located exactly a day's travel apart. Can you believe it? I can, you know. (laughs) Cities are where they are, you know. They are just (laughs) where they are. So in order to provide caravanners a safe respite before their next day's journey, Rural inns started to crop up along these trade routes. And they would they would like plot themselves a day's journey uh, yeah. from a city. <laughs> that one person would walk until they stopped and were like, it's night, this Here's is where, where we're it building. Be. Yeah. <laughs> so because of their geographical diversity, the inns had many other names besides caravanserai. Some were called funduks or wikalas. But we use caravanserai now as an umbrella term for all of the caravan inns that existed throughout history. Gotcha. Right? So those were like other language origins, those other words? Yeah, basically, f- because the trade routes in Asia and North Africa, you know, spanned so much geographically and took place over such a long period of time, there were just a number of different etymological variants for these names for the ends. And even more than those, there I found like at least three others. But caravanserai is the one that stuck. Yes, exactly. So these caravanserai were usually square or rectangular angular walled structures with an open courtyard for selling merchandise. And that courtyard led to stalls and other chambers for the caravanners to house themselves, their animals, and their wares. So would it be like a full square with an opening to get in the middle or like a U? What? <laughs> like, would the building have four sides or three sides? The building had four sides. Okay. It was a full square. It had one entrance. It was usually a large entrance so that the animals could get through carrying right. their wares. And you could go like two way traffic. Right. But it was only one entrance so that there was only one entrance that needed to be guarded. So it kept it safer, you know? Yeah. Uh, many of these caravanserais uh, included small mosques. And some provided amenities like elaborate hammams, which were oh. public bath areas, also known as Turkish baths. Wow. I mean, sure. I mean, if you're on the road for extended periods of time, you probably need a bath. Uh, yeah, you're, you're tired. You want to <laughs> relax and cover their dust and camel dung. <laughs> wow, you're just really standing right up behind it, huh? Hey, K- Kyle, you said picture it. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> So some caravanserai were more impressive than others. Um, Some, you know, some are just existing for what they need to exist for. Some were kind of gorgeous and they were like really well built. One apocryphal story tells of a man who walked into a king's palace and set up for the night in the gallery, much to the ire of the guards. (laughs) When the king asked how he could possibly be so dull as not to distinguish a palace from a caravanserai, the man asked who had lodged there before the king. And the king responded by rattling off a list of his ancestors, and then the man retorts, 
a house that changes its inhabitants so often and receives such a perpetual succession <laughs> of guests is not a palace, but a caravansary. <laughs> so uh, I have no idea how truthful <laughs> this story right. is, but... Hence the apocryphal. Yeah. So in some areas, the caravanserais acted as a network of stations that proactively helped to get travelers from one location to another. The famed explorer Ibn Battuta who traveled more than other more than any other explorer in pre-modern history described this process of the the network of stations through the funduks of China he said a man travels for 9 months alone with great wealth and has nothing to fear after sunset or nightfall the director comes to the funduk with his secretary and writes down the names of all the travelers who will pass the night there seals it and locks the door of the funduk in the morning, he and his secretary come and call everybody by name and write down a record. He sends someone with the travelers to conduct them to the next post station, and he brings back a certificate from the director of the funduk confirming that they have all arrived. Wow! So there's like yeah. a there's a, a head count and everything. Yeah, it's like a like a travel service. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like really <laughs> intense. I love the idea of like a travel service today, like not worried about like providing amenities but just like is everybody still here <laughs> yeah just like before you go to sleep someone knocks on your door just making sure you're still alive <laughs> what <laughs> gotta get a head count <laughs> how worried were you that i wouldn't be alive <laughs> oh well you know bandits have a good night <laughs> so another example of this process was seen on the royal road uh, which is not a mario kart track emily <laughs> It was actually a trade route used by Persian messengers in the Achaemenid Empire. Like just for messengers? No, I, I, it was used by everybody, but it was known for being used by these messengers. That's what it gotcha. became famous for. Yeah. Okay. So the ancient Greek historian Herodotus said of the royal road, Royal stations exist along its whole length and excellent caravans arise, and throughout it traverses an inhabited tract and is free from danger. Wow. Sounds yeah. downright ritzy. Yeah, ritzy. <laughs> so the uh, Persian royal mounted couriers called Angaros could travel from one end of the royal road, the ancient city of Susa in modern Iran, to the other end, the ancient city of Sardis in modern Turkey, in just nine days, Emily. Oh, yeah, that's pretty impressive. For anybody traveling by foot, it would have taken them 90 days. Oh my so, gosh, that's really impressive. That's how <laughs> impressive it is. Yeah. <laughs> Herodotus praised the work of the Angarium, and you might recognize one translation of this praise, which I, reads... That's crazy that I would. I know, it is. Ready? It reads, Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. The U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. So it was originally used to describe the couriers on the Royal Road, but it has since become the unofficial creed of the U.S. Post Office. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Hey, everybody, support USPS. Support, all right? Buy a stamp today. Absolutely. Emily, in fact, the Royal Road became so ubiquitous a name for safe travel and the speediness of its couriers that Royal Road is now used by extension to mean an easy way to learn a subject. As when the oh. ancient Greek mathematician Euclid first claimed, there is no Royal Road to geometry. That is fascinating. Yeah, isn't that crazy? I like it seems like a big jump, but it does make sense. Yeah. But it is usually used in like there is no royal road to a subject. Yes, the instance that it wasn't was Freud used it calling something a royal road, but that was in German and it was a translation, so I didn't want to get into that whole can of worms, you know what I mean? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Okay, Emily. So the usefulness of caravanserais prompted their spread to urban centers, right? So they cropped up mostly on these rural trade routes kind of in the middle of nowhere, right? Right. So eventually they were built inside main cities 
often near bazaar areas where they became important hearts of economic and cultural mingling across the Muslim world. Wow. So in, in that context, it would just be like an inn in town, but specifically designed for caravanners? Exactly. A good example of this are the Wikalas of Cairo. They're what we call urban caravanserais. They had an apartment complex called a Rob for travelers to stay in located above the main merchant area. So instead of it just being one walled building with one story, this had the kind of central courtyard where the merchants sold their wares, but also a number of stories above it where they could stay in like an actual room. Right. Like more like an inn. Yeah. Yeah. More like an inn. Honestly, more like a a hotel like we would have nowadays. It could be argued that inn and hotel are the same, but. (laughs) Yeah. I guess I think of, you know, when I stay at a comfort inn, I'm like, this isn't a hotel. (laughs) Well, you have to understand that I'm still living in D&D. So. (laughs) So (laughs) thanks to these urban centers, caravanserai has also come to mean a meeting place of different peoples. Like a melting pot? Like a melting pot, exactly. Cultural hub? A cultural hub. As an example, a piece published in the December 1870 edition of Fraser's Magazine describes the busy trade port of the city of Liverpool saying... Nevertheless, Liverpool, portal and caravanserai of the human race, is thronged (laughs) with visitors and passers through. That should be the new slogan for that Liverpool soccer team. I think it should be the new slogan for the Liverpool Comfort Inn. (laughs) (laughs) They gotta have one, right? (laughs) Speaking of comfort inns, Emily. Crazy segue. (laughs) Caravanserai can also be used to describe an upscale hotel, sometimes in a humorous way. Okay. Like to mean what? Like that guy's staying in in like a hoity-toity place, you know? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Emily, can you name any examples of a place you might call caravan cereal? Like a place that's like uppity? Sure, yeah. Um, I can't. I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I have an example that came to my mind. That's good. And it might just be on my mind, but the fictional Grand Budapest Hotel came to my mind, although it's geographically distant from the areas that we're talking about, especially the Society of Crossed Keys in the film and how they work to transport the main characters. It sure. seems to me comparable to that is what we've talked about That is caravan cereal today. on a number of levels. On a, yeah, it's like... It's hoity-toity. It's out of... The, it's away from the towns. It's uh-huh. a, an interconnected network. It's... Emily's um, learned the word. She's going to have um, a great um, time with the sentence this episode. They're all related to Ralph Fiennes. <laughs> yeah. Rafe, Emily. Rafe Fiennes? Fiennes? <laughs> Voldemort? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Emily... I have a bit of an aside to wrap things up with, if you'll indulge. I will always. It's about the caravanserai, the Algonquin Hotel, which was a hotspot for artists in the early 20th century. Where? I think New York. Interesting. It's still around, I'm pretty sure. Uh, But I don't think it's any longer a hotspot for artists. (laughs) There was a sort of tongue-in-cheek writer's circle that stayed there called the Algonquin Round Table, which was a group of, you know, like starving artists who who stayed there and and worked there. Sure. Uh, But this little uh, story is about the playwright and director Preston Sturges. He wrote in his autobiography this story of the actress Beatrice Cameron and her son, Dickie. Okay. He, He says, they lived at the Algonquin Hotel and introduced me to that quite wonderful caravansary by sometimes inviting me to tea there. Wow. Seems harmless enough, right, Emily? Sure. Yeah, are you ready for the rest of the story? <laughs> oh, I don't think I am. <laughs> I don't think you are. <laughs> he continues on. I started suspecting Dicky was a little off his rocker from the first time I met him. Sometimes he would make suggestions for new perfumes that were really idiotic. 
<laughs> One day, he got a revolver from somewhere, uh-huh. tied a handkerchief over the lower part of his face, hired a horse, and tried to hold up the local bus. Uh-huh. There wasn't much health in him, and not too much later, he became ill from some silly infection and died. None of those things about him were connected. <laughs> and that is the entire story of poor young <laughs> Dicky <laughs> Of little Dicky. <laughs> There was also a part in there about how he's like, every time I saw him, he was just mumbling quotes from Shakespeare under his breath. And this is like a child when he met him. Like he's like a 16 year old. Yeah. Yeah. He died at the age of 20, Dickie. Oh, wow. Sad. Sad story. Uh, It's a sad story, but about, uh, you know, a a boy who lived in a caravanserai. And that's the story of caravanserais. And what a beautiful story it was. This is a great word, Kyle. And Thank you. a word with a surprising amount of versatility. I I agree. And I, I really like it. I think yeah. I'm going to get it tattooed across my chest. I would not recommend it. <laughs> I'm going to get Caravan on one arm and Sarai on the other. <laughs> I would recommend that. <laughs> well, Emily, could you recommend me... A sentence that uses the word caravanserai in it? A sentence other than don't get the word caravanserai tattooed across your chest? (laughs) Yes, preferably. (laughs) Let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, okay, okay. (laughs) I prefer the caravanserial rest stops in Maine because they're nicer than the ones in Connecticut. (laughs) (laughs) bringing it around town (laughs) it barely uh uses the word correctly no it's beautiful i love it i'll take it thank you for that emily and you know what it was about road tripping which is a good segue into our game are you ready for a game (gasps) a game a game Emily, your game today is called Mario Kart Vanserai. <laughs> so I'm going to name a location or a route, and you're going to tell me if they're a real-life ancient trade route or a destination along said route, or a racetrack from the Mario Kart video game series. Hilarious. <laughs> okay. I mean, I might just know them from playing Mario Kart. I know. Well, that's why it's just, it'll be a Quick Sticks one, okay? Okay, Quick Sticks. Your first one. Amber Road. That has got to be a real one, because I don't think there's an Amber Road. Uh, a real... A real a tra- traveling route. You are correct. <gasps> Yay. The Amber Road is an ancient trade route used to transport amber from the North and Baltic Seas to the Mediterranean. Oh, so like north-south across Europe? Across Europe, yep, and through to, like, North Africa. In fact, the Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun's breast ornament is known to contain (gasps) beads of Baltic amber, no doubt transported along the Amber Road. That's very cool. Isn't that cool? Okay, your next one is King's Highway. Oh, this one really feels like it could go either way. I don't specifically know of a Mario Kart race track that's called that but i feel like it's so conceivable but i don't think it is i think this is a real one a real road emily you're you're two for two nice the king's highway is an ancient trade route connecting africa with mesopotamia oh whole mesopotamia (laughs) you've definitely made that joke on this podcast before (laughs) so easy From the 7th to 16th centuries, the King's Highway acted as the pilgrimage road, or Darb al-Hajj, for Mm. Muslims from Syria and Iraq to the holy city of Mecca. That's very cool. For 10 centuries, almost. Wow, that is the the pilgrimage route. Ready for next? Absolutely. Ribbon Road. Ribbon Road is Mario Kart for sure. That's (laughs) the one where you're in the toy box. It's the one we were in the toy box, yes. So it's a racetrack originating in Mario Kart Super Circuit, and in it, racers compete on a road made of ribbon, surrounded by piles of wrapped presents, although in the version you're familiar with, Emily, it was uh, remade to take place in a child's bedroom a la Toy Story. I like that we get the history of the Mario Kart track, too. I I mean, honestly, it's it's come to that point, you know? (laughs) 
Okay, your next one, Emily, is Dragon Palace. That one is also a Mario Kart track. I think Dragon Palace is the one where you start off going through the dragon's mouth. Emily, you are correct in that it is a Mario Kart track, but you are confusing it with another very similar track. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But you're right. The one you're thinking of is Dragon Driftway, which is one of the racing tracks. Dragon Palace is actually one of the battle courses in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe that has a lot of the same features. Got you. Amongst the features that it has, it contains references to Chinese culture, such as the layout of the course resembling a Chinese Si Huyun, or courtyard house. Nice. And the fact that it features a giant pagoda, or a type of tiered tower. Nice. This last one is Grand Trunk Road. Grand Trunk Road. Again, I don't specifically know of a Mario Kart track that is called that, so I'm going to say that it's real. Yes, Emily, you're correct. It's real. You're five for five. You hesitated and I got scared. The Grand Trunk Road, not to be confused with the Grand Funk Railroad, (laughs) (laughs) has connected Central Asia and the Indian subcontinent for over 2,000 years. It's it was like started being used like 2,500 years ago. Oh, wow. Is it still like in use? Uh, yeah. Main parts of the road are still used today. Uh, they were incorporated into India's national highway system. Wow. That's very cool. Love it. And Emily, you wrapped it up with a fiver. <laughs> you <gasps> got five for five, 100%. I'm so proud of you. I don't know if any of us have ever gotten 100% <laughs> on one of these games. So good job. Nice. A good job to you, Kyle. This was a Thanks. fun episode all around. And good job to all you listeners just for making it to the end. And remember that you can find Butter No Parsnips on social media, on Facebook and on Instagram at Butter No Parsnips Podcast. And if you liked today's episode, consider giving us a five-star rating or review wherever you heard us. And if you really liked today's episode, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash butternoparsnips. Donating $5 or more earns you a shout out either on social media or here on the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you. You help us make what we make. And with that, I've been Kyle Imperator. And I've been Emily Moyers. And this has been... And this has been Butter Butter No no Parsnips. (laughs) (laughs) Real group effort, that one. Thank you for listening to Butter No Parsnips. Butter No Parsnips is produced by Seth Glicksman, Emily Moyers, and Kyle Imperator. The theme music and additional music is by Kyle Imperator. If you liked listening to this episode, subscribe and give us a good rating and or positive review wherever you heard it. If you really liked listening, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash butternoparsnips. There you can get bonus content you can't get anywhere else, like the monthly Patreon-exclusive podcast Buttered Parsnips. Your support means the world to us and encourages us to keep making more. Thanks in advance, and we'll be back next week.